Senator Lankford, you're recognized for your questions. Well, thank you uh, for the dialogue on this. Uh, I've got 10 million questions because as uh, former Congressman Ray Hall, I mentioned before, I was very involved in this in the process in the beginning of it, trying to be able to figure out how to be able to get this done on it. Nick, what, why do we have two members leave? It's difficult to say, uh, Senator Lankford, why uh, two members left. Perhaps frustration, uh, perhaps personal problems. Uh, I just they left, they left, they knew they left a quorum uh, that was not available, that everything couldn't function at that point. Was there a purpose in that that would, that would remove the quorum or was it something else? I don't believe they left to purposely create a lack of quorum. Uh, no, sir. Okay, that, that, that's helpful to get the context on. What, what, what I'm trying to figure out is, obviously there's, there's lots of issues here why this didn't come together, but this is a lesson in the slowness of government and bureaucracy, the process. When we talk about, okay, it took two years to be able to get it started and then to be able to get members on board and then lost a quorum and that caused us to fall behind. And then as Ms. Maroney was mentioning before, then it became a problem between conversations between the board and um, OMB and GSA trying to be able to figure out the priorities and where that's gonna go as well. So the internal problems become the issue here in trying to be able to figure out, this, this process was originally designed to try to clear some of that out. And even Ms. Albert, your, your testimony, I, thankfully you just answered some of the questions on it. I was amazed your first opening statement, you gave 30 seconds to some of the problems with it and four and a half minutes to we need more money uh, to be able to go through GSA things. But there are issues here on trying to dispose property. That's what we're trying to be able to get to. We've mentioned a couple of these. Uh, the uh, offering to homeless, you had mentioned as well, uh, was part of the challenge that's here. I have multiple local agencies that will come to me, not just from my state, but from other states, and will say, hey, please don't dispose of this federal property because if you dispose of it, this is in an area of town we're trying to deal with homelessness, and this is suddenly gonna open it up and create a bigger issue, so please don't offer this for sale. And so when it's offered to state and local entities, they try to tie it up to be able to make sure it doesn't take to the next step on it, and so it can't be disposed of because of that jump. Now, you don't have to say that, we all know that as a reality and w where the issues are on it. The issues that I have is, so what does it take to actually do a disposal that's a consistent disposal process? And let me just do some recommendations. If a business has a piece of property that they're losing money on, they're gonna to try to find a way to get rid of this piece of property in any way they possibly can. If somebody wants to be able to take it on for a dollar, at least that gets it off their books on it from there and they can get it gone. We can't do that on the federal side. And if we do that, it's going to a state and local entity and that becomes its own issue depending on who's the decision maker on the process on that. So step one of this, what are the ideas that are coming out to say, what can we do to be able to dispose of properties where we're literally losing money just in maintaining mostly empty buildings. Anybody want to jump on that? Go ahead, Ms. Summer. Well, if I might take a stab at it, Senator, uh, certainly we need data for, to uh, conduct our recommendations, uh, data that we just don't have right now. The federal real property data, for example, that we have is two years old. Uh, we've requested an update of that information uh, so that we can make further recommendations. Uh, we also have requested uh, a list of properties that are recommended for consolidation and disposal that was due from OMB in March. We've not gotten that yet. So we, we need uh, help from OMB uh, in identifying uh, these, uh, our recommendations as well. Uh, but going back to the data point, uh, you know, we, we, we need the information. We also need a stakeholder outreach. Uh, we have attempted to do that in the past. We visited some of the sites that are on, our, on the HVA list. But we also have to have that stakeholder outreach in working with GSA. Uh, there has to be better marketing. Uh, proposals. Uh, the real estate experts on our board, and I'm not one of those, uh, but they've had some disagreements with the disposal process of GSA, quite honestly. Uh, they have felt that uh, uh, a brokerage uh, process would produce more money for the taxpayers than the online auction that has been so prevalent over the past uh, years, if not decades. 
that we feel does not produce for the taxpayer what they deserve. Uh, so th those are some of the issues that uh, uh, we feel need to be addressed in order to uh, return for the taxpayers a greater bang for their buck. Okay. That's helpful. Ms. Albert, you were going to mention something as well. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think the disposal of um, any public real property uh, takes and requires proper planning in order to, for it to go faster. Um, it requires stakeholder outreach. I absolutely agree with, um, with uh, Representative Ray Hall. Uh, I think at the crux of the matter is the, the, some of the nuances of what is the strategy or tactic of how you would you know, put a property onto the market, how you work with local governments, those are um, elements that would be required, frankly, of any decision of, uh, along a single asset. The question and the magnitude of what we're dealing with is, how do you deal with a portfolio that we want to accelerate the disposition is? The reason my opening uh, testimony spent some time on talking about getting full access to the Federal Buildings Fund is because the Federal Buildings Fund was set up to be sort of a quasi-revolving fund, that the rent and the revenues, including sale proceeds, would come into the fund and could be, and I use in quotes, automatically reinvested in improvements to the federal building's portfolio. Those improvements imply and, and include disposition. I believe that uh, Mr. Maroney, when he talks about incentives for agencies, we use the word, and it's, it's the same concept, upfront resources to do the work required to move agencies out of buildings. And if, an age, if a building is already empty, in many cases, if there's environmental uh, contamination uh, on site, we have an obligation to clean that um, before we offer it to the marketplace. So those are the upfront resources necessary that will accelerate the process. So I believe if we revert back to the original intent of the Federal Buildings Fund and GSA having full authority to access that, uh, then we'll be able to reliably plan on dispositions as well as provide those upfront resources necessary to both prepare the site as well as uh, move agencies out. And then to me, the uh, tactics or the strategy for whether you use a broker or whether we do an auction or whether, you know, whatever the, the means and methods for offering the property become the real heart of the conversation. But at this stage and where we're at right now, I believe that you will hear resoundingly from all three um, witnesses here that access to resources, access to those sale proceeds up front, a little bit more flexibility uh, to build on the authorities we already have are actually the tweaks uh, that are needed in order to accelerate this process. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, do I have consent to be able to ask a couple more questions here on time? Uh, thank you uh, for that. I, I want to drill down a little bit more on uh, some of the dollars and the, and the way that some of this is handled on it and some of the decision-making process. Some agencies, like Department of Labor, has a lot more flexibility with their facilities. When you go to CBP, some of their facilities they own, some of them GSA own. Um, and so there's some real differences there on how this is handled. Uh, the disposal process for that, uh, Department of Labor disposes of it, they get a chance to be able to keep that revenue and to be able to reinvest it. CBP, if in one of their facilities, uh, that if they've got an air conditioner out or whatever it may be, that they've got to replace it, they replace it and they go do that. If it's a GSA facility, they get in line and they'll pay an additional fee to GSA uh, to be able to then hire the contractor to be able to do the maintenance on it. So for them, literally, the cost is much higher if GSA owns that facility and the maintenance happens when they get in line for the maintenance to occur, as you're talking before, versus them having to have it. It seems to me part of the solution here is giving more flexibility to the agencies whenever possible that the agencies are actually making decisions for that. GSA has an incredible diversity of locations and facilities that literally we can't even get a data list of even the properties out there we own, to be able to have that list, to be able to know what we have, much less know how to be able to manage it from here. So why wouldn't we allow more agencies to operate like the Department of Labor or more facilities from CBP to be able to them run on their own rather than wait in line for somebody to get down to the border to be able to check it out, to be able to get in line, to be able to have a higher maintenance cost from somebody from the outside that's literally flying in to do it rather than a local maintenance person that'll be cheaper. 
So thank you for that. Um, at its inception, the purpose of creating the GSA was to achieve uh, the benefits of economies of scale and centralized management, that ultimately that would save the government money across the board. I personally still believe that uh, that is a central function to what we do and that we execute ex incredibly well when we have access to the resources that we need. Um, we do, because of the size, and as you mentioned, in some cases the ro remoteness of some of the assets that we own, uh, delegate our authority to local agencies. We work very closely with them to make sure that they're maintaining the, prop the, property, prop the property properly. Uh, there are um, differences um, in terms of uh, knowledge, expertise at the agency level when you diffuse too much of the responsibility across to any individual agency. And so we're there as the government's real estate expert in maintenance, in construction, um, to, to make sure that federal buildings are properly maintained. So uh, the, the, it is a complex question. We work with CBP in particular. They have delegated authority for maintenance, but for those uh, facilities that we own uh, and have delegated to uh, CBP, for example, it is still our responsibility to make sure that that building is properly maintained. I believe that over the last 12 years, because GSA has not had full access to the Federal Buildings Fund, what you're starting to see now and experience, and the agency is seeing this, is the deterioration of building conditions. And that is becoming a point of tension between the agency and GSA. And I think that the fix to that, to both receive the benefit of centralized maintenance and management of the real estate portfolio in GSA, as well as delivering quality and maintaining quality buildings for the agency is not who should manage. I think that there is well-established documentation, data of uh, the benefits of centralization, but we've been hindered by not getting full access to the federal building. Well, the surcharge fund. is the same for maintenance. So it, it, no matter what agency and location, their surcharges for maintenance, are they consistent by percentage from entity to entity, or are there different surcharges for different agencies? Well, the way that rent is calculated, which is... I meant for ma just for maintenance. The, uh, we build the maintenance costs into the rent. And so the rent is dictated by what we call sort of market, um, uh, market reasonable prices. But if there's a repair that needs to be done mm -hmm. that's significant, uh, that's out there, then that's going to be something that's going to be in addition to rent. For CBP, for instance, and in some of those locations that I've been to, mm -hmm. well, one of the locations, I, I, I travel all over, I was recently in Nogales, uh, where I've been before. Uh, when I talk to CBP, obviously that's a landlocked port of entry uh, that's there, and as we're walking through, we're talking about how to be able to expand, and we talked about the parking lot, and they said, well, that parking lot's actually an interesting story. GSA gave that parking lot away to the city, and we're landlocked. We can't actually expand, so we had to fight to be able to go get that parking lot back. Eventually, we're able to buy it back for several million dollars back from the city. So they're a little frustrated that out of their budget, it was given away, then they have to be able to buy it back when they're trying to be able to do repairs. Obviously, it's a very unique location to be a port of entry and the unique dynamics of it. They were explaining to me recently some of the extra costs that they're actually doing and saying, I could literally go down the street and I could hire a contractor to come and do the same thing, but someone's being flown in that's one of the approved contractors coming in from the outside and we pay a whole lot more on it, plus we pay a fee on top of that. Now that I could go into different agencies, different agencies. That's just one I was at just a couple of weeks ago. That frustration for them on how it's actually being managed is one challenge. How we're actually trying to be able to communicate how to dispose of a piece of property when if there's environmental issues, honestly, a lot of folks would say to a buyer, hey, we're willing to drop the price significantly if we're able, to, if you're willing to be able to do the environmental cleanup on this because the environmental cleanup on the federal side is going to be much more expensive than it is on the private entity trying to be able to do the exact same work to be able to clear. Does that make sense? It does, and actually I think that, that the example that you just cited is one that we would want to work with you to try and make sure that we could streamline that. Streamline that. Right now our authorities and the law doesn't allow us to do that, but we would like the flexibility to be able to do that. And that's, that's one of the things I think can Senator. be beneficial long term. If, if I might add, on the disposition... This is all the grace of the chairman here because I've gone way long on it, so... <laughs> on the disposition side... Uh, the, the, pur the purpose of PBRB, the Asset Proceeds Fund that was established by Congress, 
uh, is to pr use that pot of money that's generated by the sales, close to 200 million that's in there now, uh, is to be used to incentivize agencies to provide us information to help them move if we recommend that they be moved. Relocation costs, remediation costs, etc. cetera. Uh, our problem, and again, as I said, we have submitted legislative recommendations, tweaks that needed that are needed to the FASTA law, but the problem is that assets proceeds fund is subject to appropriation. And so, as Mike Capiano has said, a former member of Congress who's on our board and is with us here today, you have to spend money to make money. And we need to free up that assets proceeds fund so that we can provide the money to these agencies uh, to help them in their relocation costs, relocation their, relocating their employees, remediation, as I've said, or other costs. Uh, and this has trickle-down benefits to the local community because a lot of these assets that once they're, or a lot of these uh, properties, once they're sold, can be job creators for the local economies. Uh, and it can be something that is a boost to the private sector as well. So if we, we need to tweak the FASTA law in a way that allows the PBRB to spend the money that's in the assets proceeds fund for relocation, re remediation uh, of additional properties. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for allowing me to be able to push this line of questioning. I really appreciate it.